Welcome to Media Path. I'm Fritz Coleman. And I'm Louise Palenker. Here on Media Path, we point you toward entertainment that speaks to topics that are part of the current national discussion. And today we're going into politics in a big way. We've got some great films we'll talk about later. But right now, a wonderful book written by a man who's been at the vortex of all we've been through in the last five years or so, Congressman Adam Schiff. He's the Democratic congressman from once... District 28, now number 30. We're going to talk about that in the state of California. He's in his 11th term. His district has recently reconfigured, but it includes parts of the San Fernando and San Gabriel Valleys here in Southern California, down the Hollywood, Echo Park, Silver Lake, Las Feliz. He's the chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And the work that thrust him into the global spotlight was his being the lead prosecutor in the first Donald Trump impeachment trial. And we're here to talk about his best-selling book, Midnight in Washington. It is a detailed, moment-by-moment parsing of the January 6th insurrection. It's the cautionary tale that has been the Trump administration, and it's a contemplation of whether or not democracy can survive. And it's beautifully written and uh, a fascinating perspective. Congressman, we're so happy to have you with us today. Well, thank you. It's great to be with you. Um, uh, And these changes to your district are relatively recent. Tell us what's going on here and who's now included in your district. Well, I I was uh, relatively fortunate compared to uh, many of my colleagues in California and around the country in that my district didn't change all that much. Uh, I picked up some new neighborhoods um, like uh, Hancock Park, uh, Park La Brea, uh, and uh, the Toluca Lake uh, part of Burbank. Um, I did uh, lose one area of Pasadena, but then I gained a different area of Pasadena. Um, what was most heartbreaking was I lost La Cunada, um, oh, which I've represented for a long time in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, but uh, but the, the, uh, the core areas of Burbank and Glendale and Silver Lake, Los Feliz, Echo Park, Atwater, Elysian Valley, Hollywood, West Hollywood, all that remains the same. And uh, very excited to continue representing my constituents and to represent some new ones. And I just want to ask one additional question because it's as recent as this morning's news, the Supreme Court sort of upholding that appeals court decision about uh, keeping the Republicans in control of the redistricting in Alabama. Do you have any comment about that? I do. You know, in, in California, as you know, we do redistricting through an independent commission, which is really the way it should be done. Uh, so that voters can choose their representatives instead of representatives choosing who they want their voters to be. Um, The Supreme Court, this particular Supreme Court, though, has for the last several years, uh, this conservative court uh, has basically said, you can do a partisan gerrymander of uh, as much as you want um, to make it as skewed a map as possible, and we're not going to look at it. Um, And I, I think that is such a body blow to our democracy But this recent decision by the Supreme Court is along that line, which is if you're doing a gerrymander basically to stick it to the other party, then we're not going to uh, we're not going to say that anyone loses as a result, at least as far as the Constitution is concerned. I think it's a terrible misreading of the Constitution and does real damage to our democracy. Agreed. Congressman, your book on Amazon has inspired over 3,437 reviews with a solid five star rating. For example, Alyssa writes, this is a better read than I expected. Ryan writes, ignore the bad reviews by individuals that haven't bought the book, much less read it. (laughs) To them, truth are lies and lies are truth. So our country has a propaganda problem. How should we best communicate with the people in our lives who believe the lies? It's a great question. And, uh, you know, thank you for mentioning the reviews. Um, What uh, what I find so remarkable is uh, and I think I benefited from this people have very low expectations about politicians writing books. Um, They, you know, they view, and and not without reason, a lot of politicians' books as basically a long campaign brochure. Um, What I wanted to write was quite different. I wanted to write a draft of history. Uh, Impeachments are very rare in this country, thankfully, although not as rare uh, in the last administration as they have been through the rest of history. Um, So I wanted to write an historical count, but I also wanted to sound the alarm about how close we came to losing our democracy. 
uh, and why we're still so much at risk. And a big part of that is just what you put your finger on, and that is the fact that we now get our information from such different places. Uh, you know, I, one of the things I write about is that when I was in college, I'm old enough to have rushed back to my college dormitory to watch Walter Cronkite's last broadcast. Uh, and that was an era when there was a large body of agreed upon fact that we might differ with what to do with those facts. But at least we agreed that there was a thing called fact. Uh, we've now moved into an arena in which um, people say they're entitled to their own alternate facts. Uh, you have uh, propaganda outfits uh, like Fox Primetime masquerading as, as news. Uh, and the gaslighting effect uh, can be just devastating. Uh, what I find is that in this polarized media environment, some of the most important communication now goes on at the level of one to one. Uh, it's neighbor talking to neighbor. Sometimes it's family member talking to family member, having some difficult conversations, but important ones to break through that information bubble. Uh, and finally, uh, we need to deal with the algorithms on social media that really contribute to the polarization of our society by leading people down these Alice in Wonderland crazy rabbit holes. Um, we have to stop incentivizing, as we have done, these tech giants to uh, set their algorithms for engagement, which really means setting them for fear-inducing, anger-producing content, uh, because I think it's really tearing us apart. One of the most powerful comments you made during your closing, which was in the first impeachment trial, which was like a civics lesson to the United States, you said Trump is not who we are. And that sort of increased the echo there in the Senate chamber, I thought, when you said it. But there's another side of the argument that we get the elected officials that we deserve. So he's really uh, only a symptom. So how do you respond to that? Well, it's a really good point, uh, because I think that uh, one of the themes that I emphasize in the book is that power, and this is, this is something Robert Caro, the historian, once said, that power doesn't corrupt as much as it reveals. It doesn't always reveal us for our, our best, but it says a lot about who we are. And power over the last several years revealed a lot about the people I served with in Congress, many of whom, it turned out, didn't believe any of the things that they'd been saying that nothing really mattered to them except their own power or position and perpetuating that. Um, but it also revealed a lot about the country. Uh, it tore off a lot of the veneer in the country uh, and allowed people to express, uh, you know, the most uh, pernicious uh, forms of bigotry quite openly. Uh, and so it, it has revealed things about our country, which we, I think, rather uh, preferred not to have known. Uh, but. Uh, um, but but nonetheless, um, we're there uh, to behold and important for us to see. Um, I, I made that argument, Fritz, in the trial um, when I said uh, that uh, it was important for senators to convict, um, not because the president didn't believe uh, in the truth, not because he didn't know right from wrong, not because he was fundamentally indecent, but because um, they were they were decent, um, because I needed them to recognize that someone with the basic immorality of the former president could not run our great country, uh, could not be counted upon to uh, to uphold our democracy. I was appealing to their better angels, uh, and uh, and I do believe that he is not who we are as a country. Um, but there is this dangerous flirtation right now in the GOP with uh, autocracy, with authoritarianism. Uh, and I never thought we'd see it in America, but it is here. Uh, and, uh, and many are openly espousing the model of Viktor Orban, the wannabe dictator in Hungary, as a model that we should follow here. Um, well, we should not follow that model here. Uh, we have a really proud legacy as a democracy that we should cherish. Uh, but uh, but it's at risk, and we need to wake up to that fact. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about the history of Russian disinformation campaigns. Under Soviet rule in the 50s and 60s, as a godless state, they went for America's left flank. 
which was idealistic youth who were disillusioned with capitalism, etc. In the 2000s under Putin, they began to value mirror our right flank, feigning pro-gun, anti-gay and Christian beliefs. How can we help folks understand that authoritarian rule poses a greater threat than do fellow American Democrats? Um, I, I think you're exactly right about uh, Russian use of propaganda. It has a long and sordid history. Um, it's important for Americans to realize that the Russians aren't partisans. Um, they're opportunistic. Uh, they view the world in a zero-sum terms. What's good for Russia is bad for America, uh, and what is good for America is bad for Russia. Uh, and so fundamentally, they want to undermine our democracy. Uh, Putin is terrified of these color revolutions that swept the country and forced rulers out uh, throughout one of the Ukrainian leaders. It's one of the reasons why he's so fixated on Ukraine on his border. If Ukrainians can enjoy democracy, it causes Russians to ask themselves, why can't we? Um, but, uh, but it's important to note that while the Russians have amplified these right wing themes, while Russians amplified attacks on Hillary Clinton and then attacks on Joe Biden, many of the same attacks uh, questioning their health of Hillary Clinton then questioning the health of Joe Biden. Um, while they clearly had a favorite in our presidential elections, um, it was because they viewed Donald Trump as good for Russia. Uh, it's because they were afraid of a Clinton presidency. Uh, it's because they believed that Joe Biden would stand up to Russia in ways that Donald Trump would not. Uh, it wasn't because they're Democrats or Republicans, they're Russians. Uh, and, uh, and first and foremost, they just want to set Americans against other Americans. Uh, so that took the form of amplifying false claims of election fraud. Uh, it took the form of, uh, you know, um, inserting itself into the fight over gun rights uh, or uh, immigration. Um, but we need to realize it for what it is. They do not have our best interests at heart. Uh, and, and we need to defend our fellow democracies and stand up to authoritarians. Uh, and that means we need to do it at home and we need to do it abroad. Um, uh, and so I do think that uh, all of us that grew up in the post-World War II generation came to take democracy for granted uh, and, and failed to realize that every generation has to struggle to keep it alive. Uh, and we need to struggle to keep it alive in this country. Uh, I'm, are, are you at all uncomfortable with this new unholy alliance over the last couple of weeks between Putin and Xi and whatever is going on behind the scenes there? Should we be concerned about that or is that just a public relations ploy by Putin? No, we should be very concerned about it because I think what's at the root of it is China is watching Russia, Ukraine and the world reaction with an eye towards potentially invading Taiwan. Um, and so China is looking for an ally in Russia for the day when they may choose to invade. Uh, and, and I think President Xi thinks if he is critical of Russia uh, invading its neighbor, then will the Russians be critical when they invade, if they invade Taiwan. Uh, so it's very transactional. Uh, and, uh, and I do think, um, both because we need to defend our Ukrainian democratic ally. Uh, and this is the, the biggest threat of military force since World War II, uh, with Russia trying to once again remake the map of Europe by dint of military force. Uh, it's important in its own right, but it's also important because if the world doesn't respond, um, then she will take this as license uh, to use China's military might uh, to remake the map of Asia um, and and very much has Taiwan in its sights. Uh, so I, I don't think this is merely, you know, making nice or a uh, just a, a press opportunity. Uh, I think it is a um, we'll look the other way while you invade your neighbor. If you look the other way when we invade ours. Oh, that's so interesting. Wow. Yeah. Do you believe that COVID has been weaponized to divide us? Yes. Uh, I mean, you, getting back to your question before, the Russians certainly have attempted to weaponize our debate at home over COVID. The sad thing is that the Russians don't need to invent these controversies anymore. You know, back in the day of the Politburo, they had to invent things. Now they just have to amplify the nonsense that comes from some of our own people, and in particular, the nonsense that comes from our former president. Uh, and it's, it's a terrible tragedy. We've now lost 
900,000 Americans, 900,000 were fellow citizens. Uh, and so many of them did not have to perish from this terrible plague. Um, but because it has been politically advantageous for some to, to politicize the, the virus, the vaccine, and wearing masks, because some have sought political advantage in doing so, uh, because others have pushed out uh, misinformation, um, it has cost us dearly in lives. And uh, we have to find our way back to making this public health crisis a nonpartisan issue. Uh, and and focusing on the welfare of our own citizens. We just had an altercation here in Congress today uh, with a member who's a Republican member who accosted a Democratic member when she asked him to follow the rules and wear a mask, um, which we're trying to do while the Omicron has still been uh, so high here in D.C. and the, and the Hill has been, unfortunately, a hot spot. Um, so uh, the, the decibel level on this is way off the chart, uh, and it is just... Uh, I think, making us less safe as a country. Wow. I want to go back to the first impeachment trial because I I think that was such a valuable lesson for the United States. And you all were counting votes in the Senate before you even did your testimony. You knew which way the vote was going to be. There was this iron curtain that probably would not be cracked. Did you find that... Not only your presentation, but the other wonderful presentations by uh, Mr. Raskin and Val Demings were all so beautifully worded that you were really just broadcasting to the American people and trying to convince them as opposed to knowing you're going to convince a majority of the Senate to vote to impeach this man. You know, I think my uh, experience was a bit different than Jamie's. Uh, In the first trial, um, I did not believe, uh, barring um, a very unexpected turn, that we would get a two-thirds majority of the Senate to convict. Uh, and when the Speaker asked me to be the lead manager, uh, I remember telling her this would be the first trial I would go into not expecting to win. I'd been a federal prosecutor for six years or almost six years and um, won every case and expected to win every case because I was very careful in how I charged them and because I expected and enjoyed impartial juries. This was not going to be impartial, an impartial jury. And I used to tell the managers as we were trying the case, we always had to keep in mind who the jury was. And the jury was the four senators on the Republican side, we thought had an open mind, and the 40 million Americans that we thought had an open mind. Um, but but I, I mentioned the speaker at the very outset because we couldn't expect to win we had to think about this trial differently. We had to think about how, how could we win by losing? And I thought the way you can win by losing is by making the case to the American people, even if you can't persuade the biased jury in the Senate. Uh, and that's what we tried to do. And I think that was what Jamie uh, also tried to do uh, in the second trial. Now, Jamie had a different expectation. I think he thought fully that uh, they, would, they would prevail. Um, I had a, a different uh, view and, and it was a different case. Uh, and, and maybe my view of the senators was was more cynical uh, than his. Um, tragically, even after people saw in the Senate um, the impact of their uh, acquittal, um, leading, as we predicted, to new and even worse efforts to cheat in the election, leading to a bloody insurrection, even then they wouldn't convict. Um, but we did view it um, as important to informing the public even if we can't move the senators to live up to their oath of office. It, it appears that the, the insurrection is part of a multi-pronged attempt to overthrow our government, and the folks who stormed the Capitol were radicalized and perhaps unwitting. So is it a, a crime to indoctrinate people to the point where they're uh, engaging in criminal behavior on, on behalf of, of the cause? I think it gets into the realm of criminal when you get into the realm of incitement to violence. Um, And that is obviously an issue that the Justice Department is investigating and prosecuting. Uh, They recently took an important step in charging seditious conspiracy, something very rarely charged against some of the people involved in that attack on the Capitol. But um, it's very important, as you point out, to consider there were multiple lines of effort to overturn the election. It, just, it wasn't just what happened on January 6th. 
And I am concerned that the Justice Department does not appear to be investigating other potential criminality concerning the effort to overturn the election. And, uh, you know, very particularly, uh, the former president was on the phone with the Secretary of State of Georgia, trying to coerce the secretary into finding 11,780 votes that didn't exist, the exact number he would need to overturn the election in Georgia. Uh, I think if anyone else were on that call, they'd be under investigation, and not just by the Fulton County District Attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, but by the Justice Department. And I am concerned I don't see the Justice Department investigating those acts, which may very well be criminal. Um, so in terms of the, you know, leading people to believe the big lie, um, in most cases, that's not criminal unless it borders on incitement. Uh, there may be there may be a criminal fraud involved if you are soliciting money on the basis uh, of that uh, false claim. Um, but uh, but I do think that there are other ways in which the uh, the former president and others were engaged in trying to overturn the election that also need to be investigated uh, as a potential uh, criminal act. You know, toward the end of your book, in the last third, when you were sort of putting it into a larger context, can we survive and have a democracy? I, 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 I don't think there's a book that's been written about the Trump era that's had more wonderful specifics, but I came away with this really horrible feeling that of all the people, you talked about the DOJ, all of his sycophants, all the people at national security, all the people that were peripheral players in his little uh, scams, no one has been held accountable yet. Not one single person has been prosecuted. And you mentioned the DOJ. Do you think Merrick Garland is just playing his cards really close to the vest and slowly these cases will evolve and there'll be some big third act culmination down the line? I, I hope that that's true. And it's not that they're just letting it slide out of fear or something. I think Merrick Garland is a man of great integrity, and I have enormous respect for him, and it's wonderful to see the department being well-led by a person of integrity again after the disastrous years of Bill Barr and uh, uh, Sessions and, and a couple in between. Um, but uh, I, I do worry that... Um, out of an abiding concern of keeping the department out of controversy, um, out of a desire not to look backward, um, the Justice Department and the Attorney General um, may not be investigating things that they should uh, because it would be controversial. Um, well, that controversy comes with the territory. Uh, and if you take the position, as the Justice Department did for four years, that you can't prosecute a sitting president, uh, and then you take the position that as a practical matter, you can't prosecute a former president because that would be too controversial, backward learning, looking, then essentially the president becomes above the law. That is not something the founders would have ever subscribed to. It's a very dangerous idea. Uh, and given that that, that same lawbreaker um, is, I think, very much running for president again, uh, it's a very dangerous idea. And, uh, and, and, I'm sorry, just... I just want to do, uh, oops, you're being called to. Uh, Fritz, I, I, we're in the middle of a series of votes, and I'm going to have to. You know what? Uh, uh, we, we are so thankful that you were generous with your time, and we could just talk to you for hours. You're one of the clear voices of reason in Washington, and we certainly appreciate you being with us. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Great to be with you. Thank you so you much. Take care now. We'll see you again. Take care. Thank you. I'm going to run upstairs. Thank go, you both. Go, go okay. for it. Okay. Vote with your conscience, Congressman. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I just had a follow-up question about that same topic, so I didn't mean. To you could ask that. me. I'm, you know, I may be <laughs> lucid, but it's not probable. Now, so you'll you'll cut this together, and I'll just go. Into oh, the we're just going to keep. We're going to. This is the show. We'll, oh, you know, there's okay, a, cool. There's an, well, wait, I, I have an official introduction to the next segment of the program. Oh, Hang on a second. If there's any hiccups, I'll edit them out. But so far, I think we're <laughs> no, we're doing great. Hang we on. are just smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should ask each other the remainder of our questions. <laughs> I was going to ask him about. How's my wife Eva? No, Adam and Eve. Those Adam are, that's, isn't that great? 
I'm it's sure fantastic. they never tire of hearing jokes about that. All right. Well, anyway, now we're going to do some suggestions of some interesting movies since we're talking about politics and we talked about gerrymandering at the beginning of the thing. Yes. We've got a couple of great primers on gerrymandering. One called Slay the Dragon, focusing on the redrawing of voting districts in Michigan, and one that you saw, which I'm really fascinated to hear about, called Can You Hear Me Now, focusing on Wisconsin. And we're going to look at the filibuster with a beloved Frank Capra film starring Jimmy Stewart. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And I think one of the most brilliant and haunting movies ever made, A Face in the Crowd, a frighteningly prophetic fictional account of how somebody like Donald Trump even gets into office in the first place. And we're also going to look at a film that tears open the discussion about high school tragedies and how kids deal with them, sometimes leading to positive change in the world. Right? That's we, pretty much what's in the what lineup. Yes. Okay. We're going to start with a face in the crowd because it's first on my rundown. <laughs> Less works. scrolling involved. Uh, <laughs> so this is an interesting film from 1957. So it's kind of pre Andy Griffith show, but you will be haunted. You can, you it may, it may interrupt your enjoyment of, of Mayberry. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> just to just give you that kind of like alert in advance may not be for squeamish Mayberry viewers. Um, a face in the crowd chronicles the rise to power of a performer called Larry Lonesome Rhodes, played by Andy Griffith. He is discovered in an Arkansas drunk tank by Marsha Jeffries, played by Patricia Neal, a local radio producer with ambitions of her own. His charisma and cunning soon propel him to the heights of pop culture, stardom and political demagoguery forcing Marsha to contend with the opportunistic, sociopathic, manipulative monster she has created. Directed by Elia Kazan from a screenplay by Bud Schulberg, this incisive satire features an extraordinary debut screen performance by Andy Griffith, who brandishes an entirely sinister version of his country charm. A modern viewer is persistently reminded of a similarly dangerous figure. Interestingly, the film was a flop on its initial release. During an Eisenhower presidency, it may not have seemed remotely plausible. However, subsequent generations have marveled at its eerily prescient diagnosis of the toxic intimacy between media and politics in American life. It's so the Trump story. And Bud Schulberg wrote one of my other favorite movies, On the Waterfront. So oh, this yeah. guy just knows how to write current topics. Yeah. But I, I just love that film. And I saw it totally by accident and knew nothing about it on TCM one time. Mm-hmm. And it haunted me for two weeks. I thought, wow, this really is the rise of Trump. Right. It's that whole cult of personality, I guess, yes. that has been dangerous throughout history. So that's what Schulberg. As soon uh, as mass media came in, that's exactly what happened. Well, it was it was dangerous during the time of Hitler. It was probably dangerous during the time of the Caesars and, you know, whoever else was the magical figure that would heal Mm -hmm. uh, your troubled life or whatever they were promising or snake oil salesman or whoever it is that comes through town and says, hey, you know, I've got the answers right here. You know, whether it's an evangelical tent or someone selling some sort of elixir or something as dangerous as becoming the president of the United States. Yeah, yeah. really, uh, an amazing movie. I've seen it a couple of times. I'd like to see it again. Well, I'm going to do one of the first uh, movies that we saw about gerrymandering. This is called Slay the Dragon. It's on Amazon Prime right now. This is a documentary about a grassroots effort to change the system of gerrymandering in Michigan. Gerrymandering is when a political group tries to change a voting district to create a result that helps them and hurts the group that's running against them. Now, in most states, the legislature has primary responsibility for creating a redistricting plan. They come up with a new plan every 10 years because it's based on the census. The problem is that these days with the aid of some of the new voter suppression laws, Republican state legislatures stay in office for years at a time, taking power away from the Democrats, meaning wink-wink minorities, meaning wink-wink black people. Gerrymandering got its name from Eldridge Jerry, the governor of Massachusetts years ago, who came up with this mapping system to favor the party in power. The shape of one of those districts looked like a salamander, so they called the system gerrymandering. Both sides do it. Republicans and Democrats. This movie shows a grassroots effort to change the system in Michigan. The focus is on a young activist by the name of Katie Fahey, who believed that 
voting districts ought to be decided by a citizen's commission, like the congressman mentioned is done in California, not by state politicians in power. It goes through a whole uh, bunch of scenarios. Uh, uh, Their launch point is the Flint River water controversy where the Republicans in the state legislature seized back power and changed the water supply that turned out to be toxic to humans. And then uh, this young woman, Katie Fahey, had to get 350,000 signatures to put the proposition on the Michigan ballot and they went, and went all the way to the Supreme Court. It's a great David and Goliath story. And I think the most powerful aspect of this film was in the opening credits with a quote from John Adams gets slowly dissolved on the screen, and it says, democracies never last long, they commit suicide. Wow. So I went through the first half of the movie thinking about that, but it's a, it's a wonderful premise. That's journey. haunting. Yeah. <laughs> so in a similar vein, probably a couple years later, they made a film in Wisconsin, which seems to be the, the ground zero for gerrymandering. Uh, the film is called Can You Hear Us Now? Wisconsin is a minority rule state and grassroots citizens are boldly and purposefully attempting to rescue and reclaim their voices and their representation. For example, Kenosha is a democratic stronghold and the folks who live there deserve to have their values reflected in their state representative. They don't. The city has been cut in half. The top district is drawn to pull in conservatives from way into the surrounding area. The same has been done to the bottom half of the city. This goes on statewide to where Democrats won 54 percent of statewide votes for assembly candidates. They won just 36 percent of the seats. I, I, I don't get how that's legal. It's just it just criminal. Wisconsin voters are finding their lives increasingly irrelevant to state lawmakers. This film follows everyday folks with multiple jobs and kids running for local office. You will come away with a better understanding of the use of the term running in regards to elections. It's a marathon and a sprint. Long hours, long drives, long walks through neighborhoods, early mornings, late nights. These are folks fighting to fix our broken system. The setting is Wisconsin, but it's happening in towns and cities across our nation. Can You Hear Us Now is a call to action, and you can watch it on Amazon Prime. And it sounds like the same emotion you're left with with Can You Hear Us Now uh, in, in combination with Slay the Dragon is you have these ordinary citizens that have a little idealism trying to change the system, and they're bucking up millions of dollars in Republican headwinds Pushback, against yeah. them. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's it's sad, but it's wonderful in, in another way. Well, it's in, it, it's it, it's inspiring because you, you know, you you feel this sense of community that they're building in, in terms of striving for something together and how that bonds you to your neighbors and that sense of purpose. And so it really does want to make you, it does inspire you to become part of the solution. It doesn't, I, it didn't scare me off. It just makes me want to rise up and see, well, you know, what can I no, do? It doesn't scare me off. It just makes me, oh, you see, yeah, they're, no. they're bucking an impossible. Uh, thing here. And also in Michigan, uh, I don't want to give the movie away, uh, but they won. They they got that on the state ballot and they won. They, they This little group of well-meaning older ladies <laughs> made, made a difference and it was wonderful, but oh gosh, when you look at the amount of money being thrown at it. Right? Anyway, here's one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, I want to talk about this one, too. Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, one of Frank uh, Frank Capra's most beloved movies and one of Jimmy Stewart's most beloved performances. This film was made in 1939. Jimmy Stewart plays a naive youth leader of a group called Boy Rangers, and he's appointed to fill a vacant Senate seat from his home state. He's got idealistic plans when he gets to Washington, but they run headlong into political corruption, including some from his home state. He's taken under the wing of a publicly esteemed but secretly crooked politician who was a great friend of his father's at one time, which made it even harder. Smith's naive and honest nature makes him easily manipulated by the unforgiving Washington press, which is so today. He comes off as a bumpkin. Now, the interesting thing, this is based on an unpublished story by Lewis R. Foster called The Gentleman from Montana, which was loosely based on a true story, the life of Montana Senator Burton Wheeler. In the story, Jefferson Smith, as he's called, and it's no accident that Jefferson is his 
first name. Mm-hmm. He proposes a bill about funding a campsite for young boys in his home state. His plan bucks up against plans that a cabal of other crooked politicians have to put up a dam at the site where Smith wants to put his camp. Well, Smith won't give up. Up. And that's where the filibuster comes in. A filibuster is a form of not letting the game end or not letting the other side have a break until they give up and say, you win. It's like a game of political chicken. It's designed to protest or uh, protect uh, minority views. And there are other specifics about a filibuster that we don't have to go into here. But the poignancy of Mr. Smith is he does this 24-hour uh, marathon on the House floor and uh, he's a hero, and he, he garners all this grassroots from people all over the United States, and it's wonderful. But but honestly, if you look at this movie in terms of where we are right now, the darkness of our political atmosphere, the poignancy of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington comes in, in Jimmy Stewart's wide-eyed enthusiasm and idealism when he first gets to Washington. He revels at seeing the Capitol Dome and the Lincoln and Washington monuments, and it's such a stark contrast uh, with the way the Capitol was desecrated during the insurrection and it, the low self-esteem our country finds, in, uh, finds itself in right now. If you want to feel better about the United States, this is a great view. Yeah, and, uh, you know, his his tour of the monuments also is in, in complete contrast to what he then immediately encounters, which is a lot of diabolical behavior and kind of like hidden deals and, you know, graft and secret kind of handshakes and money's being lined or pockets being lined, et cetera. But like, you know, people think about Mr. Smith goes to Washington in terms of the, the great filibuster. But what it really also depicts that it's just kind of harrowing how similar it is. And it just kind of speaks to maybe this is human nature and the nature of people when they come to power or the types of personalities that seek power. But the disinformation campaign, the controlling of the media, you know, in, in, in that time it was it was the, the, the newspapers. They tried to make sure that n- none of the newspapers and his state published the truth. They com- they completely twisted the truth. They made up lies about him. They kind of flooded the Senate floor with uh, telegrams that were coming in that that were asking him to get off the floor and relinquish the the floor. The telegrams reminded me of that scene where Trump and his kids had these stacks of papers. <laughs> it was like you know pure theater. So it, this is 1939. And the big money in politics. And I thought about Citizens United when we're watching yeah. that guy Powell or whatever his name was. That was he. He was buying all the politicians. Yeah. And so the tactics have not changed. It's the exact same. The technology has shifted, but the tactics are the same. It's it's this disinformation uh, campaign to discredit him. And he, like they were trying to Al Franken him. They were trying to get him to step down from his Senate seat, not just to step off the floor, but to step down from his Senate seat, but in disgrace. And he had done nothing other than, you know, working for the people. I just loved his morality. I loved his enthusiasm for the country. And I kept saying to myself, I want to feel like that again, really. It was a a wonderful movie. Yeah, so those are great movies to watch. It's like, what's so great about our technology, one of the great things about it is that everything's accessible. So, you know, we can say the name of the movie. You can jot it down in the notes of your your, uh, iPhone, or you can just... uh, Call it up. You know, I was talking to Fritz about our guest next week, and he pulled up his phone and, and downloaded the, bo- the book while we were waiting for uh, uh, Congressman Schiff to come on the line. So that's how quickly, you know, we can access the media that, that we're seeking. Mm-hmm. And so now we're going to talk about a current movie because I think it's it has a, a political – resonance in terms of why is this still a problem because it 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 absolutely you plant your your face in your hands when you watch this the movie is called the fallout and it's on hbo explores the emotional impact of surviving a school shooting as shots ring out through the hallways veda huddles terrified in a bathroom stall with mia a classmate bursts in covered in his slain brother's blood they survive and the shared terror bonds them as we track their efforts to navigate through a reality that has been forever changed for them. Veda and Mia hibernate and escape through drugs and alcohol. Their friend Nick turns to activism, much like David Hogg, but not everybody is capable. We're, we all react differently to trauma. Um, Quinton focuses on his family grief. He has lost his little brother. We are each different, and the film invites us to wonder how we would process this level of devastation and to ask, what are we doing to our kids who undergo live shooter drills and walk through their schools terrified 
every day. It also left me asking out loud if Republican lawmakers refusing to pass gun safety reforms even have kids. And if they have them, do they love them? Why are they so busy banning books and not guns? I'd like to share this tweet from David Hogg. Can you pull that up? Uh, It's on your rundown, Thomas. You know how many kids and staff books killed at my high school? Zero. You know how many kids and staff a former student killed with an AR-15? 17. Guess which one the Florida legislature is working on banning? So, Great tweet. Yeah. I, I, I really, uh, we, we only had limited time, but I wanted to get into that book situation right. with the congressman because right. he's been very passionate about a peripheral item, which is to make sure that uh, textbooks in classrooms reflect the truth. Always bring them up to date, new interpretations of history, but make sure they're factual. So I'm sure he had an opinion or two about this current book burning thing we're going through right now. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to talk to him about that. Yeah. And I mean, I, 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 you know, maybe Thomas and Dina can speak to this, but I think the Streisand effect is in effect here because if you tell kids not to do something that it's entirely accessible to them, as we, as we have recently discussed. And so, yeah, I would think kids being kids, you, you tell someone not to read something, you know, she's going to want to read it. And you've just brought attention to the book. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if these banned books are at the top of bestseller lists currently just by virtue of them having been called out. It's all the culture wars. It's all based on this phony controversy of critical race theory, which is only being taught in one law school in the South. It's not even being taught in high schools. It's all this manufactured culture war that at the end of this election cycle probably will evaporate and we'll never hear from I'm it just, again. I'm just curious as to whether or not we ha- the, the times are, are gone when you can simply burn a book and make it disappear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I think that um, it's it was really myopic on the part of the the Tennessee. I don't know what I can't remember what part of Tennessee, but the school board to ban mouse because their entire explanation for it was because there were some bad words. Yeah, and there was one picture of a guy with no clothes on, which was everybody was, in the camp. I think Aren't it was a naked? woman, and mm-hmm. there could have been like nipple a nipple situation. I mean, it was just so ridiculously inconsequential. Mm-hmm. And No, it's anti-Semitic is what it boils down mm-hmm. to. It really doesn't have anything to do with... Yeah. Know, yeah, and then we're also having just to, you know, this is like a broader thing, but because of that and Whoopi Goldberg... On social media, there's a, a really big conversation um, that's happening about, like, you know, about Jews and, like, you know, wh- is Jewish a race? Is it an ethnicity? Everyone is, like, discussing this, which is really shedding a light on how little people know about this topic, how little um, Jewish history and Jewish the Jewish American experience is known about. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fine for her to say that, you know, when you walk through the world as a black woman, you're, it's different than my Jewish friend walking by my side who seems white. And, you know, race is a social construct anyway. It's like we're all just saying that something is a thing and maybe there's genetics that back it up to some... But there ought to be like, more understanding between the oppressed classes. You sure. Know I mean? I mean, in, like, like the point I made to the congressman was that in the in the in the '60s, Jews were the first ones to get on a bus and go down and help black people register because we related to each other. You know, they had just survived the Holocaust. The children of Holocaust survivors were signing up uh, people to vote in the South, and uh, we understood oppression. Also, Jews have a history of slavery if you go back to the Bible. So. Can't we just all work together? It just seems like there's right wing factions that are terrified of oppressed people teaming up. And so they they seek to divide us by pitting us against each other. Dean is our producer. Dean, I think you should tell people the few people that might not know what Mouse is describe what it is. It's a mm-hmm. graphic novel for written for young so people. So I'm afraid I haven't read it, although I was at Barnes and Noble. <laughs> this and it's funny because it so I was at Barnes and Noble to buy my son manga this weekend and it's like right there on display right like they put it out because it's being talked of about course, yeah. and now it's like an opportunity for everyone to to read and buy and read mouse um but what i know about it is that it's a graphic novel it's uh my understanding is that it's a representation of you know what went on in the camps where jews are represented by mice and um the nazis are represented by by cats and it's a way of explaining the Holocaust to young people because it's too exactly. big for small brains to understand. Exactly. And uh, uh, there it is. V- very important, you know. 
And I mean, now they want to ban like To Kill a Mockingbird and stuff that's been part of the American literary canon for years and all this stuff. And what was the one that was just banned by the Pulitzer Prize winning? Uh, uh, Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison. Die? Yeah. So, yeah, you can't just it, you just can't just imagine a world where these these strives had not existed and where we don't still have to heal from them that just makes the wound fester Go ahead, so i just think it's fascinating that we're having this discussion and this happened to come up you know in tennessee right as we're having um a discussion about joe rogan and spotify mm -hmm. where so many of rogan supporters are their entire basis for their support, not of Joe Rogan specifically, but of you know him staying on Spotify, is the issue of free freedom of speech, and yet we have this odd, like simultaneously there's a situation where they're banning this book, and not a single Joe Rogan fan is talking about That's that. So true. It's a great irony. That's crazy. it's really it incredible, and the difference between you know, like there's so much that these books are offering so much, you know, potential discuss. I mean, there's just like a limitless amount that can come from reading these books, knowledge and conversation and everything. And Joe Rogan is just a guy who lets people like spout, you know, shoot their mouths on his show. I mean, it's this huge difference in like value between what and and the discussion is completely separate. No, and I don't think really that the Republicans point. should be permitted to speak about cancel culture without first mentioning what they did to the uh -huh. Dixie Chicks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, and that, you know, and that may have happened before the internet. I'm not exactly sure what year that Which was. Which was but complete crap. It was of course, just a joke. Because, because Trump said way worse things about America on yeah. foreign soil yeah. than Natalie Maines ever said. All she said was about, you know, she was, she was, uh, Upset about the Iraq War, and that yeah, was the extent of it. Deal. It wasn't anything. So, and they, and you know, country radio stations publicly burned their records. That was when you still had CDs. Let me ask Dina a question. Mm -hmm. So, how old is your son, Dina? He's he's going to be eleven in May. Do they ever discuss? Are these issues ever part of the conversation in elementary schools? They do. Um, they talk about. Uh, the experience of oppressed and marginalized groups in America, you know, especially, you know, now that it's February, there's a lot of discussion about Black History Month. You know, I do have to say that since COVID, they've gotten a little lax with um, or at least, you know, that's how that's just how I feel. You know, my experience is just one classroom. You know, LAUSD is a huge you know, organization, but my experience is that there was a little more like, um, uh, you know, they were focusing a little bit more and doing a little bit more work where they were exploring like Black History Month, like, you know, we we're talking about, you know, various um, black people who made a huge contribution to culture, to science, you know, everything that defines America. I feel like there's a little less of that going on now, but there's definitely been a discussion of you know, black that. Americans. You know, the I just Holocaust. wonder if the fear about the books is translating to fear about even having a discussion in a classroom and letting kids ask questions. Or yeah, is that happening in California where teachers would be concerned about talking about slavery and, and uh, I'm sure, Native American history? I'm sure that it's happening in parts of California. I wouldn't be as a LAUSD parent. I don't see that happening in okay, in Los Angeles County, just because we have just so many. I mean, I Disparate just have groups. I have to like admit that you know most parents are left liberal leaning, and also in this a county. lot of parents are parents of color. <laughs> like it's, no one's talking about parents of color as yeah. being parents. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The and California, you know, we're we're way different than the rest of the purple and red states. Sure. And we're, we're, you know. Yeah. I mean, Los Angeles is a special case. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be concerned. I'd be concerned about anywhere else, um, but definitely not Los Angeles. There's just more, you know, openness because you know where we have the entertainment industry here, mm -hmm. and you know, culture, society, everything here leans towards open discussion. Yeah. You know, I noticed that there was like a an immediate pushback to this being Black History Month. Like, it's a surprise, you know. Oh, my gosh. You, you know, how? It, it, let's make sure that this isn't discussed in my child's school. But all of the networks, whether it be Netflix or Hulu or Amazon, prominently display Black History Month as being the first choice of content that you could select. 
So we don't seem to be in the entertainment industry shying away from presenting people with things that might interest them, educate them, inform them, et cetera, you know, just because there's this whole Republican contingency pushing against it. You know, and I, I... I agree. And I also think that we can't analyze the rest of the country like we analyze California. I know the rest of the country, you know, they're trying to figure out what the next step is going to be with the three percenters and the Proud Boys and all these people that staged the insurrection. And it seems like their new method of operation is to go local, go into local politics, show up at school board meetings and announce Mm -hmm. the protests. So You have to, there's a lot of noise in some of these various locales around the United States. You have to be able to separate what is that agenda with what's really going on in these schools. And maybe it's not as bad. It's just we're paying attention to the noisiest part of this discussion right now. You know, that that could be, uh, you know, it's concerning that a teacher would worry that if she just presented a basic idea that she could be putting her job at risk. Yeah. You know, the idea of being kind to one another. Yeah. You know, like what what's happening to us? Mm-hmm. You know, because people making a lot of noise can create terror. The terror is just being afraid. So if you're afraid, you know, if you're if you're thinking like, you know, just to give you like a, a strange example, um, when I was at Premiere, we were producing these bits about like uh, they were kind of parody commercials about Scientology and we'd send them out to radio stations. Well, we started to get harassing phone calls from the lawyers at Scientology, and I told my team, let's just stop. In other words, it worked. I didn't mm-hmm. need this headache. So there are teachers who are thinking, is it, is it worth it you know, to teach something and then risk someone going home and saying, hey, we learned about Harriet Tubman, and, and now the next thing you know, we're, I'm out of, this teacher's out of work, but you can't afford to be out of work. Yeah, and it's not just disagreeing with a viewpoint. It's the, these people's lives are being threatened, like the election oh, workers yeah. and stuff. I oh. mean, it's dangerous. And all this is dangerous. We're in a very violent time. And that's time. the definition of terrorism, creating terror. Right. Exactly. There's just something that I, I have to say, which is it really disheartens me, the lack of respect that's being shown to teachers. Yeah. And um, the disrespect that is like the slander of like teachers unions, you know, that are looking out for, you know, our teachers since since the pandemic and since, ha- you know, having to deal with like some homeschooling. I really have a newfound respect for <laughs> teachers. I that, bet all parents do. And the fact that these, you know, hardworking, underpaid, undervalued individuals are getting treated the way that they are just it it destroys me. It makes me feel really sad for like this moment that we're in. Well said. Well said, Dina. And not only that, but because of, you know, the nuclear family, the fabric of the nuclear family is falling apart. So teachers are not only teachers. Now they're being like a surrogate parent. Mm-hmm. These are single parent kids and they they have to be a disciplinarian and they have to solve home problems in school. It's, they're, they're having they're being. Um, a sign with more than being a teacher now, which is really hard. Right. And as you say, they're underpaid. And the unions are designed to protect them for these moderate salaries that they have, you know, with insurance and retirement and everything else. Right. And they have the most important job in the world, oh, educating yeah. our children, which you know, there's nothing more important. Um, I would like to talk about what we can do. And, you know, something that a project that I took on that I, you know, hopefully will inspire you that there's something that you where you can take what your strength is and apply it towards being part of the solution. Uh, Myself and some lady friends, I'll call them, although one is my sister and one is my sister in law. We created this is just hot off the presses, a website called Give the Gift of Democracy. And what it is, is it's just really a clearinghouse that sends you to the swaggy sites uh, where you can purchase, you know, a mug or a hat or something fun and have that be the gift that you give a loved one. So if you're thinking about you know, your gift list and you're also thinking about saving democracy, you can do both in one move where you click and someone's getting a, an apron. So yeah, it says your dad has enough drills, your sister has enough shoes, what they need is a future. And then when you scroll down, you can click, um, and click on the top one, the Democratic Store, because the Dem- Democratic Store has some really sweet swag. Um, that should be a link, yeah. And you can buy all kinds of fun oh, stuff, wow. and then that can be the gift that you get someone for the, whatever. So this was pre-existing, or did you yeah? Design so we're just no, no, no. We're we're linking to the swag oh, site. So okay. if your candidate has a swag site, as Adam Schiff does, and you can go down and click on Adams because he was just on our show, so he gets a click. Oh, um, he's created cool. some sweet swag. Oh, I wish we would have told him that. I know. I, I didn't know how long we would yeah, have him, but yeah. you know, that's okay. I mean, we're looking at it right now. 
Yeah, uh, and you can. Cool. I think people will feel inspired to buy something for a loved one, and then also stock up on something for themselves because it's just fun stuff. Yeah. And I, I was just thinking, this is something easy that people could do, is to just buy a gift for someone and have that be also a donation, you know, towards a, a candidate or a cause that's fighting to uh, save our democracy. That's a wonderful idea. Thank you, Fritz. Never been more important. I'll buy now, you how something. How much of a profit are you taking? Not rates? nothing. We're okay. simply linking. <laughs> all my friends ask this, like, "What's your cut?" No, no. <laughs> I, we paid for the URL and we're paying to host it <laughs> no, on Wix, no, no. and we're we just want. I'm being sarcastic. We want to we want to know what you want, Fritz, for for Christmas or for your birthday. Do you want a tote bag or a I magnet? I would like some. Uh, I would like the. Uh, I believe in democracy lingerie. Do you have anything like? Can some you scroll underwear? through there, uh, Thomas? Is there any lingerie? Okay. Um, where? Oh, the apron. If you wore that without anything else, I think yeah, I, I think you could make that look pretty lingerie. Down with autocracy. <laughs> I can see you. Those are Joe's aviators. Nice. There's also a, 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 a Joe. Oh, that's cool. I like there's that. A, there's a ice cream scoop that you can get, a Biden ice cream scoop. And there's wow. a fly swatter, or is that a spatula? I don't know. Maybe so it could be a grilling spatula, but I'm sure <laughs> you could do all spatula. sorts of things. Oh there's a lot of fun stuff. So have That's fun, cool. go shopping, and save the world. What's the website again? It's givethegiftofdemocracy.com. Right there. You know, this gives us a chance to tell you how much people love us. Let me, let me give a couple of comments. How much do they love us? They love us. And I can't even imagine how much it cost us to get these particular testimonials. Just kidding. Uh, the title of this one is called Hysterical. I think I found a new favorite show. This show had me laughing the whole time. I almost cried from being double O. <laughs> Which show was that? Mm -hmm. The hosts are amazing, and I love the witty banter between them and their guests. My favorite episode so far is the one on comedy I've listened to four times. Wow. And that's from, I see a bunch of numbers. It looks like a, a B. an account number. AB2793. What's that supposed to be? That's their prison hit? number. So whoever you are there, AB2793, we appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And I hope they shorten your sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Fritz and Wheezy, two of a kind. What a crazy pair. One pair of matching bookends. Dif <laughs> different as night and day. When Fritz enjoys a minuet, the ballet ruses, and the crepe Suzette. Our Wheezy likes to rock and roll a hot dog. Your like to mixer. rock and roll a hot dog. Your, your moves in the review. Don't sing. Just listen to the review and then sing. Wheezy likes to rock and roll a hot dog. Makes her... Lose control. True fact. What a wild duet. <laughs> and that's just episode one. <laughs> wow. If you, if I, I didn't know that I could like write reviews for people's books and shows simply by quoting TV theme song lyrics. Is that what that was? I didn't even write Yes, that is the Patty Duke show. <laughs> what, what the ballet ruse? What's that from? I mean, that's that? what Kathy likes. Oh, okay. Yeah, because she's, was, was she I'm British? I'm not old enough to I remember don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I All right, screwed well, that up. It's hard to believe that earlier Adam Schiff was here. I know. Well, we're so bursting much has happened. on. Yeah, we, we had to be respectful for 20 minutes, and now we're just exploding. <laughs> now we're showing our real selves. Yeah. Write a review about this part of the show, lady. So we hope that you'll write a review, and all you have to do really is quote, you know, Gilligan's Island theme. Mm -hmm. Honestly, as long as you give us five stars, it doesn't matter what you type. Yeah, we're, we would we're we're love thankful. to hear. And, you know, we would love to hear stuff that you would enjoy hearing on our podcast. You know what our strengths are. If you would like us to interview maybe a deposed ruler from a foreign country, something like that, mm -hmm. we'll do anything. Uh, give us some suggestions. We'd love to hear those. As you know, well. I know that Adam Schiff told us that he was going downstairs to vote. Yeah, how I know that's true because that voice is... Please report to the floor of the Congress for vote number 742. Didn't you hear that? I did hear that, but I don't think he actually voted. I think he went down there and he spoke to Nancy Pelosi about possibly being on this amazing podcast. and she would. That just... would be unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> she is a Californian, you know. Yes, yeah, she is. And, uh, and we just want to thank Adam Schiff for being with us. That was you know, quite a treat to speak He's with him. He's a very charming person. And I, I, as I said to him in person like mm -hmm. two years ago, right? I said, I know this sounds like I'm pandering to somebody in power, but I, you are one of the few, this is it, it, sort of the last third of the Trump administration. I said, you are truly one of the voices of reason and thank you for your hard work. It must seem very lonely out there right now because there weren't that many, you know, uh, there were uh, uh, opinions similar to his pushing back against the onslaught of bad media. Yes, it, it, he was uh, heroic and, uh, you know, and sure-footed. 
you know, whenever he speaks, you know, every word is so well chosen. His brain is just quite well organized to deliver just common sense in, in, a, in a way that's approachable and digestible. And it, it really helped uh, bolster us through the Trump uh, regime because that's just, why his book was uh, really well written. It was beautifully written. Yeah, he really is quite an mm-hmm. elo- an eloquent and, and great storyteller. So mm-hmm. you should get Midnight in Washington and read it. You know what I did, Fritz? I I listened to him tell me the book. That's even better. And it was like having him as a passenger in my car. I learned something about. <coughs> pardon me. Mm-hmm. I learned something about books on tape, and I wish I knew this when I was younger. I learned more from hearing something than to reading it. So I love books on tape. When I read something, I think it's an ADD thing. I have to read the same paragraph like twice or sometimes three times to absorb it. But when I'm listening, it's it's one pass, and I seem to absorb it more. It, it requires different muscles of concentration. I think I'm the opposite. I think I remember books that I've actually read with my eyeballs better than – to me, I just miss Adam talking to me. But I don't remember the book as well as if I had read it. But I I love listening to his voice. So that so there's that, and uh, I it just he's just a beautiful writer. Because I think when you're listening in the car, and your mind was wandering, you can't you can't go back. Whereas if your mind is wandering when you're reading, you can go back and read the paragraph. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to be a distracted driver. Mm-hmm. You know, job one is driving. Yeah. Even if you're listening to I'm Adam so Schiff. technologically uh, stunted that I wouldn't know how to wind back my audio tape to listen to it. There's a little button, and we can show it to you. Like um, in the lower left, you can go 30 seconds back, and on the lower right, you can go 30 seconds forward, but not while you're driving. You've got to focus on the road in front of you. Mm-hmm. But I think we should all learn how we learn best. Because you're right, some are visual. Some I, I are discovered audio. that about myself. So I would have done a lot better in college in the latter half of high school, where I just to be able to listen to the teacher talk as opposed to. You know, when I was in middle school, and I would hear about that you would have to take notes in high school. This is what all the older kids were saying that you're going to have to take notes. I I was terrified. How am I going to write and listen at, at the same? Like, how do you do that? Mm-hmm. I thought I'll, I'll now never kids just record it and go back. And yeah, but back then it was like, I'll never be smart enough, you know, and no one taught me, you know, you can maybe write down like a little one word prompt that will remind you of the topic and know which, you know, it was, I, I, I think I'm a definitely an add or mm-hmm. Oh, I am. That, that's, yeah. That's and there was no course. help for that. So when my nephew went to high school, he actually uh, was able to pick up notes from another kid. Yeah, well, he's a genius. Don't compare yourself. He to is him. a genius, but it was it was understood that this is how his mind works. He's not going to be able to take notes. Mm-hmm. You know, let's a kid who's good at listening and writing at the same time, someone who's whose mind works that way, and then you know share the notes. There's just better tools or better understanding of how different kids learn mm-hmm. now than there was when we were growing up. When mm-hmm. we were growing up, it was like a you know a kick to the seat of the pants, and you were told you were stupid if you didn't if you didn't mm-hmm. have all your homework done. And uh, for me, absent-minded. A daydreamer, I think was what they called us. Oh, yeah. If they didn't want to say mm-hmm. idiot, they said daydreamer. Doesn't live up to his potential. Yes. Mm-hmm. Works and plays well with others, but is not living up to his potential. I think we should wrap up this show because it's been a great show. It seems like two and a half, three hours. Yeah, we've been here talking for a <laughs> I want to thank Dina. Dina had some great, uh, um, it was a great addition to the show today. Great. And, and thank Ryder for being here in, in spirit, her son. Yeah. And thank you, Thomas, for Thank you, Thomas. Orchestrating all of the above. We would love for you to join us online and on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full episodes with all kinds of bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. We would love to know what media you have been enjoying. You can contact us at our social media or email us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. We want to thank Our guest, Congressman Adam Schiff, vote for Schiff. Our team includes Dina Friedman, Francesco DeManda, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filippiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Planker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path.